The next one we're going to talk about are nucleic acids. Nucleic acids consist of everything except for sulfur, so carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. They function to store and transmit genetic information. So these, this is your genetic material. DNA and RNA are the two major types. And the, we use DNA and RNA in a process called protein synthesis. So the DNA, which is found in the nucleus of our cells, sends a copy called RNA out into the cytoplasm to be read by ribosomes to form the proteins that make our body. That process is called protein synthesis, and it's done through transcription, DNA to RNA, and translation, RNA to the protein. When we look at the different nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, they have very similar but slightly different structures. Nucleotide, the nucleotide is the monomer, the smallest part of a nucleic acid. This is a nucleotide right here. It has three parts, a phosphate group, a pentose sugar or five-sided sugar, and a nitrogenous base, or we just call them base. If you look at this picture up here, this is showing a nucleotide of DNA. So there's a phosphate group. RNA has the phosphate group, same thing. Here's a five carbon sugar. But in DNA, it's a deoxyribose sugar. And in RNA, it's a ribose sugar. That's where they get their names. And the third part of a nucleotide is the base. In DNA, the bases could be thymine, adenine, cytosine, or guanine, T-A-C-G. But in RNA, we replace the T for a U, which is called uracil. So this base right here could be either uracil, adenine, cytosine, or guanine. DNA also forms double strands, so that's double-stranded, and RNA forms single strands. So, a couple differences. DNA has a deoxyribose sugar, RNA has a ribose sugar. DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil, and DNA is double-stranded, and RNA is single-stranded. But either way, they're both nucleic acids because they're both made of nucleotides. Now, there's another nucleotide that you may have thought of, and this is actually ATP. So ATP is a type of nucleotide because it has the five-sided sugar, it has a base, in this case adenine for A for adenosine, and then it has phosphate groups. But in this case, instead of having one, which would make it a um, DNA or RNA nucleotide, we have three phosphates to make it adenosine triphosphate. Now, why is this important? This is our energy molecule. And when we have this ATP molecule and we break off this third phosphate in a hydrolysis reaction, it releases a whole lot of energy. And this energy is what powers our cells. What's left over is called ADP. And to go from ADP back into ATP, all you have to do is reconnect that third phosphate back on. And so there's a cycle that happens with that. But it's another type of nucleotide, which would be classified as nucleic acid. The last type of macromolecule, but not the least, are the proteins. Proteins consist of everything except for phosphorus, and they have lots and lots of different functions, from structure, motion, defense, hormones, enzymes, buffers, transport, and storage. Structure, they build things, like your, like your bones and muscles. Same thing with motion, your muscles. Um, defense, your immune system and your white blood cells, they're made of proteins that fight off infections. Hormones, we just talked about them. Yeah, they're lipids, but they also, there's protein hormones that could send chemical signals to your body. Enzymes control the rate of a chemical reaction. Buffers contain pH and make it a steady state. They could transport things throughout the blood, like hemoglobin is a protein that transports oxygen in the blood. Storage, they could store molecules too. And so these are some examples. Lactase, catalase, lactase breaks down milk, catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide, hemoglobin carries blood, or excuse me, carries oxygen in the blood, insulin controls your glucose in your blood, antibodies fight off foreign invaders, and there's a lot, lot, lot more. Everything in your body is protein-based. Proteins are made of a monomer called an amino acid. And so amino acid, here's a structure of amino acid, this is a generic structure of an amino acid. It has a central carbon with a hydrogen on one side. It has a carboxyl group on the other side, a COOH, and it has an amino group, an NH2, on the other side. And then the third, the last side is an R group, which is a side group. This can change based on which amino acid it is, so the amino acids. When we get amino acids and we start to put them together, 
these are different types of amino acids, we get a long chain called a polypeptide. There are 20 different amino acids that are found in the human body and all living things. We have essential and non-essential amino acids, which means that our body makes some of them, but our body has to consume the other ones that we don't make. Amino acids are categorized based on their chemical properties. So if they are nonpolar, they're in this green group. That means that there's, they share equally electrons. If they're polar, they are in this group. If, they're, if they form a base, in solution, they're here, and if they form an acid in solution, they're here. And so there's different categories of them, but they all have the same general structure. The general structure, if we look at tyrosine, again, there's a carbon, hydrogen, here's the amino group, here's a carboxyl group, and then this dark yellow box is a side group. Notice the side groups are the only thing that change from amino acid to amino acid. And so this is actually what your genetic material dictates, what order of amino acids could make the polypeptide, which makes the proteins in your body. Proteins have to fold together in order to be functional. So here's a bunch of amino acids in a straight chain. They will have to actually fold in order to be a functional protein. And it has to go through these folding processes. So the primary is a straight chain. And the secondary is when it starts to bend or twist around. And this is where hydrogen bonding comes into play. And then tertiary is when it folds on top of itself. And then when it gets together with another polypeptide, or even more than one, it will actually make a functional protein. And so those are the different protein folding structures. Now protein, you don't get the protein until you have at least two or more polypeptides folded together. And their shape of how they fold together determines what their job is. And we looked at all those different jobs on the function Slide, slide a few slides ago. So if hemoglobin did not, was not shaped like this, it could not carry oxygen. If insulin was not shaped like this exactly, it could not control the amount of glucose in your blood. And um, this is actually venom from a snake. So this is um, uh, what you don't want in your body because it could actually disturb your, how your neurons work with each other and the communication, if it's a neurotoxin, for example. So you don't want the structure, but if you denature it, then it wouldn't work, and that's what antivenoms actually do. Now over here, you could actually denature a protein, which means you can mess up the shape. If you expose it to different temperatures, pHs, or heavy metals, it will unravel, and therefore it can no longer do its job. I want to focus on one of the functions of proteins, which is enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in, in the cell, and they do this by lowering the activation energy needed. So if you look at this, a chemical reaction won't occur unless it has a certain amount of energy to make it go. And a lot of times that energy level is really high. And so if you look at this red line, if you don't have an enzyme, you could see that this is the amount of energy that you need way up here. What enzymes do is they reduce the amount of energy needed. They speed up chemical reactions to make them happen a lot faster. So the blue line shows if you have an enzyme present, the reactions happen at a greater pace. And that's a very good thing, obviously, or else you wouldn't have anything happening in your body. This is how enzymes work, and so if we start over here, this big blob is going to be our enzyme, and enzymes have something called an active site. This active site is right here, and active site is where the substrate will kind of fit in. And when they come together, the substrate, in this case sucrose, is a sugar that has to be broken down. To break it down, you need an enzyme to do it, in that case sucrase. All enzymes end usually in ACE. So that's how you know it's an enzyme. When sucrase gets together with sucrose, you get an enzyme substrate complex. That's when they're actually both together. And this is where the chemical reaction will actually occur, will start to occur. And so they will bind together, the chemical reaction will occur, and so the water, you need water for the reaction, for a hydrolysis reaction, it will break the bond between them. And then after that, it releases the products. So when you break down sucrose, you get fructose and glucose, two monosaccharides. Afterwards, the enzyme is not used up. It's, all, it's pretty much the same, and it could redo the job over and over again. So you could reuse the same enzyme over and over again to do the same sort of job. And that's kind of how an overview of how enzymes work. They're necessary for every single chemical reaction in your body. Okay, I know that was a lot of information in a very short period of time, but I hope it was helpful and come to class with any questions that you may have. Bye.